Maharaja. Hello and a warm welcome to each and every one of you who has tuned in. Today we are going to be exploring the world of machine learning through our speaker Divina, who has prepared an exciting and informative session to get you started with the basics. Passing forward to Divina. Hello everybody, I hope you're excited for today's session. So the basics of any machine learning uh, any machine learning system that we build is the algorithms that we use for classification, for regression, for any form of operation, we'll be using different algorithms. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the 10 most basic algorithms. These algorithms are so important to the field of machine learning that we have decided to call them as the backbone algorithms. So today we're going to be looking at 10 such algorithms and we'll be going in detail learning about each and every aspect right from the um right from the numerical implement the python code implementation and the graph and the formula so we'll be looking at everything in detail and i think we're ready now and we can start with the presentation Yes. OK, so. So before starting, I'd like to ask you all one question. How much do you know about machine learning? Like, where did you get to learn about machine learning? Um, is what is this a new interest of yours or have you been exploring this field for a long time? So you can just put in the chat box what all you know about machine learning so we can get an idea of where to begin with. So. Or are you new to the field of ML and you're just starting out and you want to learn? So anything that you want about about your journey with ML, you can write in the chat box. Okay. And as I said earlier, let's just look at the overview of the entire presentation right now. So these are the 10 most backbone, uh, the basic algorithms, which I called as backbone algorithms earlier. The first, the most simplest one is linear regression. The second algorithm we'll be looking at is the logistic regression. And then we'll be moving on to decision tree, KNN algorithm, SVM algorithm, native base algorithm, K-means, random forest algorithm, dimensional reduction algorithm, and gradient boosting algorithms. Now, all of these algorithms may just sound like fancy name to you right now, and you might not really understand the full form or it's what it's used in. But I think we can all take a seat back and we'll be going very slowly and we'll be understanding every single aspect. So don't need to worry if you don't understand any of these words right now or they look very you know uh, daunting right now this is just for those who have already uh, you know no machine learning and they want to know what, understand what's going on in the session all right then let's start i think the energy is good everyone's active in the chat box so we can start now and uh, let's start with the linear regression algorithm so linear regression is uh, actually a mathematical concept it's a statistical approach so in which there is a relationship between our input and output. This is the basic fundamental of like any program, right? There's we give an input and we get an output. So this is more of a, a statistical model that is developed based on this basic principle. It's so input input is called as input is called as features, input features. They are the independent variables because they are not dependent on any external factor or you know anything else or any other conditions that you apply on the data. That does not uh, that is not you know apply to the in input features because input features is basically on the basis of which the entire model is built right so input features are called as independent variables and the output is a dependent variable because the output is what we modify and we get the final value so the output is called the dependent variable so our goal what is our goal in any machine learning algorithm it's to predict the output when we get a certain input and in terms of in like in linear regression, what happens is we multiply the input feature by a given factor and we get the output. So that is basically what linear regression is, like how we learned in any mathematical graph in a straight line. What happens if you multiply X by some factor, you'll get a straight line, which is Y. So that is how this graph is also modeled, as you can see. So um, this what we have is input on the x-axis and the output is there on the y-axis. And here, because it's linear regression, it's linearly related, we have a straight line. Okay, let's continue. 
So where do we use linear regression? So some basic real life examples of linear regression, it is to predict the sales of a product at economic growth, petroleum prices, emissions of a vehicle, and the GPA, even the impact of GPA. So these are all very linearly related uh, factors and real life examples because uh, let's say sales, sales will be dependent on how good the marketing is. So it's the better the product is marketed, the better the sales will be, right? So it's pretty simple and it's linearly related. That is, you just need to buy, multiply by one factor and you get the final answer. So this is basically real life examples of linear regression. And now we'll look at the simple linear regression, the formula that we will be using. So as you, as we already know, the only thing that our linear regression model, the output is dependent on is the input feature. So the formula that we'll be using is Y is equal to B naught plus B one into X one. So what are these different uh, element? What are these different variables that we have over here? So Y is the output or the dependent variable. And V naught is the constant or the Y intercept of the line. So the Y intercept is when you put X is equal to zero, you get the Y intercept. And B one is the coefficient of the input feature. And X one is the input feature. So input feature is the independent variable, right? Independent variable on which the operation is done. So X is the independent variable. Uh, B one is the coefficient of X one. B naught is the constant of Y intercept. So this is the formula and by adding and multiplying these or carrying out these operations, we get the final output. So, okay, so right here we have the linear regression, the step-by-step -step implementation that we will be doing. Uh, so I like to, uh, this is the co entire code. We'll be going looking at the code step-by-step, -step, but I, some of you might just want to look at the code, entire code in the first, and then you might want to like uh, understand the different steps. So I'll be sharing. Uh, so those for those of you who want to. Okay, so this link will be shared with you in the comment section and you can follow with the link. All right, now we'll be looking at the step by step exactly how we do linear regression. Okay, so what data set are we considering? For linear regression, we're considering a very basic data set that is the CO2 emissions which are released by a car. So obviously different vehicles release different amount of CO2 and now we have something called environmentally friendly vehicles, not electronic vehicles, but even petrol vehicles, some of them have their advertising, we are more environmentally friendly because we have lesser CO2 emissions. So how do we calculate CO2 emissions when you're given different information about the engine and different factors? So first, for any uh, machine learning algorithm, we need to import the libraries. So we are going to be importing the libraries for linear regression over here, which is uh, pandas. First, we need pandas. And we're importing numpy and mat.lib for plotting the different graphs and sklearn. Uh, sklearn is imported from the linear model uh from the linear model and as you can see yeah these are the we've used these uh we've used all these libraries multiple times so it's nothing confusing over here i hope uh, if you have any doubts at any stage during the presentation you can share it in the chat box all right so now that we've imported all the required libraries we will be reading the csv file so the csv file is our data set so as you can see over here, we have different parameters, which is model here, uh, the, the make, model, vehicle class, engine size, cylinders, transmission, fuel type. You might be wondering why are there so many different columns and what are we going to do? So uh, this is actually, when we're further, we're actually computing it, we'll be using these different columns and we'll be making our calculation. Okay. Now, what do we do after? So now we've seen, we've imported all the libraries. We have seen the data set. We have seen the CSV file. So now we select the features that we need for predicting. So obviously we don't look at this. We have so many different features. Some things like model year will not make a difference on how we are going to predict the CO2 emissions, right? There are such some things such as the engine size, cylinders, transmission can actually be useful. will uh, make a difference. So what are we doing? We are selecting features to uh, which will be useful in predicting the values. So in this case, we'll be using engine size as our sole feature for predicting the CO2 emissions. 
okay uh, now we've decided what feature we need to use also now we'll be going on to plot the data so engine size versus co2 emissions that is our graph which we will be plotting and to plot the data we have uh, plt dot scatter we're putting the different parameters and we're putting the color of the points data points and then we're labeling x-axis y-axis and we're showing the graph so this is very simple uh, what we're doing over here i hope you understood the code okay so now that we have the graph we can understand we can make somewhat sense of the data so but we still do not understand we do not really completely get a very clear picture right so for that we need to train the data and then after that we need to test it also so generating for we need to generate the training and testing data for um, the different uh, CS, this entire CSV file that we have. So we are using 80% of the data for training. This is not necessarily 80%. It can also be, um, you know, 90%. You want to do 75%. It's up to you. So why do we do this? For, to check the accuracy. So to check for the accuracy, we'll have to uh, divide and our data into training and testing databases or data sets. So we'll use the training data to train our model and then we will check the accuracy of our model using the testing data. So we can uh, suppose you really want to check for accuracy and you don't care that much about training, then you can put more data into testing and less in training. So it depends on your whatever your interest is and whatever your use case is, you can divide it into training and testing. All right. So now we are training. This is the actual machine learning part that we, not actual, the basic. Uh, what we're doing here, how we're going to train the model. So if you remember, we had uh, a previously imported SKL learn. So that's what they're showing over here as well. From SKL learn, uh, we're importing linear model so all right so this is the entire modeling process that we are going to take that's going to take place right now it will be divided into slope intercept so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the coefficient so we're trying to find the best coefficient for our fit regression line best fit regression line so okay you can see over here from uh, we have linear model dot re linear regression so for the regression we're just putting it, simplifying the name so we don't have to repeat it every time. I write the entire uh, derivation like linear model dot linear regression. Instead of that, we can just write regression, REGR. So then train x, numpy dot array, we are training the engine size. And then for train y, numpy dot array, we're training uh, CO2 emissions. That is the x and y coordinates of the graph. And then we are putting it dot fit. We are putting train x and train y. We're putting the different x and y coordinates to the regression and then we're printing it. So we're printing um, regression coefficients and we're pr printing the intercept. If you remember our equation that we used, so we have the coefficient and we have the intercept, right? So we'll both of them come in the equation that is B naught and B. So for that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to find that so that we can find the output. So, okay. Now, after we found, now that we found our both coefficient and the intercept, we can go ahead and we can plot the line, right? The best fit line. So best fit line is the most efficient or the most, um, let's say the, av the average line that encapsulates the entire data set. It's not on the higher side, it's not on the lower side, it encapsulates the data set as a whole. So, okay, so what are we doing here? We're plotting. Uh, plt dot scatter train engine engine size comma train co2 emissions and where color is blue and label we've already seen this uh, plotting part before and we are doing the we're plotting the line now right now and this is the emission line so this plot best plot line then okay now that we've plotted the line so what did we do till now we found the b naught we found b that is the we found, uh, as you can see here, the coefficients. We found the intercepts and we found the plot line. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to see, look at the prediction function. So the prediction function is what we saw in the beginning. That is the mathematical equation that we use. So the output is nothing but input features into slope plus intercept. So this is what we saw in the very beginning when I was talking about the very definition of linear regression. And now we're going to find the output and we're going to return it. That is all that the prediction function does. It takes in all the different parameters, calculates it, and returns the output. 
okay so now we'll actually come to the interesting part which is the predicting the co2 emission so let's see we have let, so given that your engine size is 3.5 we're trying to predict the co2 emissions for it estimated emission get regression predictions so the get regression prediction is the prediction function into the prediction function we're putting the different parameters that is the engine size and the intercept um, and then we have the estimated emission which is returning right so the estimated emission is 262.95 so if the engine size is 3.5, this is the estimated emission. This is the actual prediction, how it works. So now that we, what have we done? We've seen the data, we've seen the prediction, what we're using, we've seen the different parameters and the function. Now we want to check the accuracy because sometimes what happens, everything will be picture perfect in theory and you might everything might make sense. But the accuracy of the model, as I spoke about earlier, training and testing, that ratio might get a little messed up so because of which our accuracy will get affected so now we're going to be looking at how uh, we will be checking for our, our accuracy of the model and uh, okay so how do we check for accuracy we can check for accuracy by comparing the actual values with the predicted values so there will be data which is collected in real time about the co2 emissions and there'll be data of what our model predicted the CO2 emissions to be. So comparing both of them, we will check for the error and we can find the um, how accurate our model is, right? So from SKL, SKL learn, uh, dot matrix, we import R2 score and R2 score, we test test X, we have array. we test the engine size, then we test the CO2 emissions, then the regression dot predict, we test the regression function. Okay, so the mean absolute error is the numpy.mean, numpy.absolute, test y minus test y. Okay, and mean sum of squares, so we're basically using different mathematical equations to check for the mean app error. So first we're checking absolute error, then we're checking the sum of the squares, and finally we're getting the R2 score. So this test y and test, what is this? Uh, test underscore y underscore is nothing but the test the output function and this test y is this actual co2 emissions so predicted minus what it is actually we're getting we're checking for the absolute difference in them and once we find the absolute difference for every data point we are finding the mean and in the sum of squares we're finding the sum we're subtracting the predicted one from actual one from the predicted value and we're finding the square and we're finding the mean of all of the squares. There is the mean of sum of squares. And finally, we're getting this R2 score. So R2 score is a criterion which we will use for checking the accuracy. And so that is here we have an R2 score of 0.71. So this is the end of our linear regression. So we'll just go through the entire thing once again. Uh, if you go to this link, you'll find the entire code and because looking at the entire code at a whole might be a bit confusing for some of us. I've divided into the different sections, but you can go at any point of time. You can put this link in one of your uh, in probably Word or somewhere you can look at later so that you can understand the entire code for some time later. All right. So first we imported the libraries, pandas, numpy, matplotlib for plotting and sklearn for uh, for predicting the linear model then we have data we're reading the csv file the different da the data set then we have the features that we are considering to predict the value in this case only engine size then finally we're plotting the values based on the points we have for engine size and the carbon co2 emissions then what we're doing we're dividing the data into testing data and training data and finally we're, tra we're training our model uh, of using this linear regression uh, method and and using by training our model we also get the different uh, factors i mean the different coefficients like the coefficient and we get the intercept which are the different parameters that we need for the mathematical function so then we find the best plot line or best fit line over here and after finding the best fit line according to that we create our prediction function so that the from the best fit line we get the slope that we require and that slope will be put into our prediction function and we get the predicted values so predicted values is basically the output that we need 
So after that, we're actually doing the prediction depending we'll, we're passing different engine size values and we're getting the predicted CO2 emission. And after every all the prediction part is over, we're checking for accuracy finally by comparing our predicted values with the real time recorded data. So that's it for linear regression. I hope uh, all of you have understood. Uh, if any one of you have any doubts at all, please put in the chat box about uh, linear regression. We'll be moving on to logistic regression now. So before that, I just want to uh, make sure that all of you understood what's going on. And if you want to add, uh, I mean, if you if you want to like for me to elaborate on any point or have any doubts at all, please put it in the chat box. All right, I don't think anyone has any doubts as of now. I'll also be asking for doubts after I complete every algorithm. So you can still put it in the, even if I'm in the, uh, in the middle of presenting, I'll come back to it later. All right, so I think we all understood linear regression quite well right now. This was a simple, uh, simple data set that we used, simple case that we had, but it is, I think it encapsulates very well what linear regression is. So uh, using the same principle, you can also divide your um, any problem that you face or any uh, use case that you want to check, use, uh, operate on using linear regression. You can divide it into all these subparts and you can easily understand it. In, if you look at it as a whole, it might look a little confusing, but if you divide it into subparts, I think it makes perfect sense. All right, now we'll go on to logistic regression. So logistic regression is um, a classification algorithm. It's a supervised classification algorithm, which predicts, again, the class or the label based on the input variables. So it's like linear regression. This is also we have output variables. We have input variables, which we call as features. And the function of the logistic regression is to predict the output variable. Or the, in this case, we call it label. So in binary logistic model, we compute a linear combination of inputs and then we pass it to sigmoid function. So it's actually the process of logistic regression. We first find a linear combination and then we pass it on to a function which we call a sigmoid function, which we'll be looking at. And then the, the we'll find the final output depending upon the output of the sigmoid function. So it can, if you see, if you see, it can be divided into two steps. First, we find the linear combination of inputs, then we pass it to sigmoid, and then the final output of the sigmoid will be the result of the logistic regression. All right. So uh, as you said, it's written over here, sigmoid function maps the linear combination of variables in value onto the Bernoulli probability distribution with domain zero to one. So if, I think most of you would be familiar with sigmoid function. It's um, its value ranges from 0 to 1, and this probability is used for classification. Even probability is from 0 to 1, even the output of the sigmoid function is 0 to 1. So since the result comes in the same format as probability, we can use it for classification. Some real life examples of linear regression that we have. So uh, we can predict whether a patient has coronavirus infection or not using linear regression. These are a lot of uh, you know, decisions that we make, uh, whether logistic regression can predict the output and the of a like an output given so given circumstances or an output of a decision. Like will the customer purchase a product or not? Financial forecasting. Like even in terms of share market, will this company purchase the shares or will they leave it? Or will another company do it? So and then we have software cost prediction. Uh like we have different um technologies which are coming out like Bitcoin and blockchain technology. So uh, in case we are supposed even like cryptocurrency, so even both the currency as well as the software, which is we are implementing it, it can use, it'll be useful in cost prediction and election result prediction. When we have different candidates, we can predict who's going to win based on certain parameters and using logistic regression. All right. So logistic regression, what is the formula that we use? So this is what I was trying to explain earlier. We have a function, which is, this is our linear regression function, if you remember. Y is equal to B0 plus B1 into X, where X is the input uh, variables, which is the independent variable. And we have B0, which is the Y intercept, and B1, which is the coefficient of X. So when we, and then we get the output, which is Y. So we pass whatever we get from linear regression into the sigmoid function and sigmoid function will give us a value which is between zero and one. And that will be the result of our logistic regression. 
So inverse logistic regression of sigmoid function is uh, 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus t. So t is nothing but the output characteristic of a linear regression. So the final output of logistic regression that is f of x is equal to 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus b0 plus b1 into x. So b0 plus b1 into x is the output that we find using linear regression. And we put that as a, uh, as the parameter, one of the, uh, in place of t, we put the entire equation and we get the output of the logistic regression. So now let's look at how we do the implementation. So again, we have the code. I have the entire code. If anyone wants to uh, look at the entire code at the beginning itself and then follow, you can use this. Um, I will be sharing this in the chat box again. I'll just... So now we'll be going ahead and looking at our step-by-step -step implementation in Python. So import required libraries, and then we split the data. So, okay, we have, for this, we'll be using a breast cancer. Earlier, what we did, we tried to predict CO2 emissions based on the engine size and other factors that we that were given. So now we're going on to a little bit more complex uh, database that is breast cancer prediction. All right. so. Okay, so uh, as the same as what we had last time, we're importing NumPy as NP from sklearn where dot model selection, we're importing train test split. And from sklearn, we're importing data set and we're impl importing matplotlib for plotting, plotting purposes. All right, so uh, one thing that is different, so earlier we just, we had importing libraries a single uh, slide. Now we're also splitting the data in the same slide. So, Let's talk a little bit, one second. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to share some things that makes it, you can understand better. Okay, uh, this slide is not included, but I'll just tell you something before we go ahead. Uh, the sigmoid function over here, 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus v0 plus v1 into x. So if we'll look at the look at the inverse of the sigmoid function, 1 plus 1 plus e, 1 plus e to the power minus t, right? So suppose the output comes to be 0, what happens? We get the sigmoid value as 1 by 2 because e to the power 0 will be 1. 1 by 1 plus 1 is 1 by 2, which is 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 is what we, we 0 0.5 will give us a straight line. All right, so this is uh, the reference value that we are having. So this reference value will be useful later in, later in the prediction. So that's why I just wanted to cover this small part before we go ahead. All right, I hope you understood the reference value. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for sigmoid, we are having, all right. So first we import NumPy. NumPy is for uh, data manipulation, then data set of SKL library to import the data. Test split, uh, test train split is something we did not see in linear regression. It will be used for splitting the data into training and testing. There we did it directly by ourselves. Here we're importing a module for that. And matplotlib will be for visualization as I already said. So we will store the independent values of X and Y so oh, that's what's happening d is equal to data sets dot load breast cancer so this is the data set that we are loading and x comma y we are having uh, d dot data d dot target so we will store the independent values in x and dependent values in y and the training using train test split model of sklearn learn we are splitting all our data so x train x test x y train y test instead of finding like making four statements out of it or four lines of code out of it we are using this function which makes it easier for us all right so now we've looked at how we're going to split the data so initializing weights and bias to zero self dot bias self dot weights so uh okay so initially we don't know anything about the coefficients right so we don't know what coefficients will lead to what weights so we will assign zero for all the weights and bias and small value for our learning rate so um, number of weights is equal to the number of independent variables that is in the beginning all coefficient value will be zero okay so basically what i'm trying to say is 
we don't know anything about the prediction of what the weights will be, what any of our parameters will be in the future. So we're assigning zero for everything now. And as and when we find out what it should be, we'll be assigning the correct value. So n samples n features is equal to x dot shape. And then we have the init parameters. Self dot weights is equal to numpy dot zero. So we're just putting all zeros inside. And self dot bias is also zero. So that's what we're trying to do over here. All the coefficients will be zero. That is b1, b2, bn, everything zero. Then we have the sigmoid function. So sigmoid function we already saw earlier, so now you will be able to understand. So instead of numpy, numpy dot exponent of minus y, we are finding we are passing the value into sigmoid function and we are trying to get the output. So let's go ahead. Okay. So now weights and bias, everything we had set to zero. Now we are using a loop to actually update the correct values, right? So okay. So now we have to change the values of the coefficients so we can get a better model with a higher accuracy because coefficients at zero doesn't make any sense. Also finding better values, we will create a linear model first using the values. And then we will pass this model to sigmoid function, which will give us the predicted output value. So we already de uh, described a threshold, which is 0 0.5. By putting t is equal to zero in the sigmoid function, we get a 0 0.5, which is the, uh, which is the threshold. Let's assume first by using gradient descent, we get new values for coefficients. Now using these values, we will create a model, which is an equation. And we will pass this model to sigmoid function to get the predicted uh, values, which are between 0 to 1. So by comparing these values to the threshold, we will perform the classification and we'll get our output. So to change the values of coefficient, we will have to take derivative. So we have to take derivative with respect to weights and bias to change the value of the coefficient. So, and then we will update the weights and bias by multiplying it with the negative learning rate to the derivative. So that is basically the function that is happening over here. So I'll just go through it once now properly. So gradient descent for i in range self dot n iters. So n iters will basically number of iterations. Uh, then we approximate the output variable y with a linear combination of weights and x and then the bias. So linear model is n pi dot dot x comma self dot weights plus self bias. Then we apply, apply the sigmoid function. So y underscore predicted is equal to self dot sigmoid of the linear model. So linear model is the output of the linear regression. Then we put it into the sigmoid and we get the predicted. Then what do we do? I told you, right? We have to find the derivative. So that's what we're doing over here. 1 by n samples into n pi dot dot x dot t comma y underscore predicted minus y. So this is derivative with respect to weights. And then the next uh, equation that is dB is the derivative with respect to bias. Then we update the parameter. So self dot weights is equal to self dot LR into derivative with, um, with respect to weights. And self dot bias is equal to self dot LR into derivative with respect to bias. Now this might look a little bit confusing if you haven't uh, understood what the data set is and what we're trying to do, but I hope uh, it's basically we're, we're trying to find the weights and the bias right over here and we're putting the correct values, right? So then only we can update it and then we have to multiply by negative learning rate with God. So yeah, that's what this function is doing. So selecting the for loop is a important choice because bigger range, if you select, as you see over here, self dot n iters if we select a bigger range that means there'll be more number of iterations and more number of iterations means better accuracy so you might think this is good actually but even the time complexity will increase but but in the case of a smaller range uh, we might get a poor fit because accuracy may not be correct like may not be high and there'll be a final error which is not near the point of minima that we're looking for so bigger range if you use too much of a big range it'll be overfit for the model, whereas the lesser range might not give accuracy for the test data. So we need to find an optimum range value which we can use so that our uh, logistic regression will work correctly. So now we'll go on to creating object and fitting the model. So what is regressor? Uh, regressor is equal to logistic regression. Learning rate is equal to 0.001. And iters, and iters is what I was talking about, the iteration. If it's too big, it's a, it'll overfit the model. If it's too small, accuracy won't be there. So that is the n iters I was talking about. 
and uh, there is something called as learning rate also. So there are many stopping criteria for a gradient descent, like initializing the number of iterations and stop when the change in prediction is less than epsilon. So uh, I will try to explain uh, detailed gradient descent in, in, a, in a while, but here we are defining the loop as a sto stopping criteria because it cannot go on infinite loop, right? We need to stop at some point. That's why we have all these parameters. So lay, uh, first, what we're doing here, we're initializing lay, uh, learning rate as 0 0.001 and number of iterations as 1000. Learning rate always has to be a small value. Now, this you have to remember, it should be between 0 to 1. So what is this learning rate? Learning rate is the rate at which the speed of weights changes. So speed of change of weights. So like, uh, if you want, if you if you're putting a very high value, like then it won't, it won't bigger value of learning rate increase, uh, like indicates rapid changes, but it might skip the minimum because it will go so fast. The changes will go so fast that the point that we wanted to reach, that is the point of minima will be skipped and it will just keep on going. So we need to put an ideally a low one between zero to one. And here we're putting 0 0.0001. So what will happen if we run the for loop? Let's see. This is what we get. We get an array of different weights and we get the regressor bias as well. So after running the values, we get some values for the coefficient and the bias used in model, which will give us the better results. So the model with the new coefficient, now that we found the coefficient and we found the bias values, we are going to use it to test the data. So what were we trying to do all this time? We were trying to get these values only, the weight values and the bias values. So now that we have got it, how did we get it? We used the we used the logistic regression function. How did we get logistic regression function? We did linear regression. We passed it on to sigmoid. We found the weights. We found the bias. We passed it. Uh, we did it using logistic regression then, and using the predict function. And finally, we got it. We got the weights. We got the bias. And now we're going to be um, defining the prediction function which is linear model is equal to np dot dot x comma self weights plus self bias. So this is the function that was called earlier. We used predict. See, prediction is equal to regressor dot predict. So this is the predict function. So y predicted is equal to self dot sigmoid of linear model. We're passing the linear model into sigmoid and we're getting the y predicted. And so why are we doing this? The next line, y predicted CLS one if i greater than 0 0.5 else 0. So why 0 0.5? 0 0.5 is the threshold value. So if it's greater than that, we release, we get 1. Otherwise, we get 0. And then we're finally returning the array. All right. Now we have act. This is a prediction function. We would have returned the array and we would have got the prediction. And we're going to test it now. So testing, uh, OK. A predict function, we already saw how it takes x and y. I, I, it is very similar to our, what our linear regression we did the parameters and the basic, a very basic term. So I'm not going to cover that right now. Um, but I think the only difference is the sigmoid part and the logistic regression, which I have covered and the threshold. Okay. So accuracy function will give us the accuracy of the model. It will take the actually predicted values and the values that we have been collected real time. So how do we know what is the accuracy of this model that we have? So n pi dot sum if y equal to true is equal to y dot pred divided by len of y true. So I'll show you exactly how what it gives. So this is what's happening. So ITR, if you remember, is the number of iterations and accuracy is the percentage of accuracy, like 92%. So you see, if we give 1,000, we are getting the highest accuracy. As I was telling you, if you have lower uh, number of iterations, see the accuracy is very low. For 10 iterations, we have 0 0.39. For 100 iterations, we have 0 0.69. So increasing number of iterations will increase the number of, uh, increase the accuracy. But if we increase it too much, then the accuracy is again going down. See, for 1,000, it is the maxima point, maximum accuracy, which is 0 0.929 almost 93%. But if we increase it further to 2000, we're getting 0.921, which is reducing. So there is a certain, you know, number of iterations for which for which we get the maximum accuracy. We need to be mindful of that when we are choosing, uh, when we are doing the, when we're conducting the program. So now, uh, now that we found out what it is, this is, we're trying to plot the graph. That is the number of iterations and the accuracy that we are getting. 
So using the graph also, we can see what is the point of, you can see 1000 is the maximum point. Below that it is low, after that also it's decreasing. So, okay, so this is this was our logistic regression model. So finally, what did we find? We found the point with the maximum number of, we found the iteration, which has the maximum uh, accuracy. And if we put this uh, uh, iteration in the logistic regression function, then we will get the predicted value, right? So now we've tested it. We've written the entire code. I'll just go through the entire thing once so that we can understand and not have any doubts. We are importing all the required libraries. Then what we are doing, we are splitting the data into training and testing. We are initializing the weights and the bias to zero so that we can later modify it and put the correct values. We are defining the sigmoid function. Sigmoid function is what makes logistic regression lean, uh, different from linear regression. Then we have to update the weights and bias. So this is what we found. We found iters, the number of iterations. If you put number of iterations here, everything else will fall into place. Linear regression, we are finding the linear regression, what we have, uh, the values, y dot predicted. We are putting it into sigmoid and we're getting the predicted values. And we're finding the derivatives for updating the parameters. Then we have the logistic regression function, which we have learning rate and iterations and what uh, predictions regressor dot predict. So it's going to predict the, uh, we have the predict function over here, which gives it the array of the predicted values. So this takes a linear model and then we put the linear model into sigmoid, we get the final predicted values. So using the predicted values, we can put a plot a graph and for checking the accuracy, again, we check if uh, the actual values that we get and the real time observed values. And for accuracy, we also change the different iterations, number of iterations, we find the accuracy for different things. And we plot the graph, we find the um, point where the accuracy is highest, in this case, 1000. And then when once we find the number of iterations, put it in the prediction function and we get the correct predicted value. So this is all about a logistic regression right now. Uh, now we have effectively, we have very successfully done both linear regression and logistic regression in only 45 minutes. So if you have any doubts, you please put it in the chat box. Um, I hope it's clear. I just want to ask, are you guys understanding? Is it clear or should I change the page? Should I go slower or faster or do you want me to do it again? Can everyone just please put in the chat box if they understood or not? Okay. I don't see any replies. Are you guys understanding? Is anyone, is every, are you here? All right. Okay. If you have any doubts, you can put it in at any point, as you said, as I said earlier. So logistic regression is done, linear regression is done. So this itself is a big milestone for us. So we've done two of the most basic and most important algorithms that we use in, um, that we use. Okay, great. So it's clear. Thank you. So I'm happy that it's clear till now. Now we'll be moving on to the next algorithm. So decision tree. Decision tree is something we have been looking at ever since our childhood. We have to make decisions. If, if this happens, then we'll do this. If this happens, as simple as going out to play. If it rains, I will not go out to play. If it doesn't rain, I will go out to play. So simplest decisions we have been making using if-else conditions, and that can be expressed in the form of a decision tree. So this is, okay, what is decision tree algorithm in terms of machine learning? It's one of the most popular algorithms that we use today. It's a supervised learning algorithm that is used for classifying problems. It works well for classifying for both categorical and continuous dependent variables. So in this algorithm, what we do, we split the population into different sets based on a particular condition. And these sets are homogeneous. And based on the most significant attributes or the independent variables, we will be dividing the sets. All right, so as you see, if you look at this diagram over here, we have decision node, which is the root node. And the root node is divided into uh, separate decision nodes, which are sub, which then have their own uh, decision tree, which is called a subtree. 
So we have a decision node and then it has its own leaf nodes. So decision node, leaf node, and then here again, another decision node, leaf node. So decision nodes and leaf nodes, uh, these are like, this, these are the conditions that we will be checking. And if this condition is true, this uh, leaf node is the what will be executed if this condition is true. The other leaf node is if what will be executed if the condition is not true. So that is the decision tree. So how do we implement decision tree in Python? We have a data pre-processing step. Then we have a fitting a decision tree algorithm to the training set because we need to find what algorithm suits it, the particular case best. And then we fit it to the training set and then we predict the results and then we test the accuracy of the result. That is the creation of a confusion matrix. You might be wondering what is a confusion matrix and how will the confusion give result to accuracy? But we will be looking at that. And then we have visualizing the test, uh, test set result. So this is the Python implementation code. For this, now I, the, what till now what we did, we looked at the different aspects of the code in short shorts in, in many different segments because I just wanted to make sure everything is clear so that when we move on to more complicated algorithms, we can look at it as a whole and uh, we can try to understand it. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. Um, I'll be sharing this link again. So I don't um, now I don't want to no longer continue the Python implementation in the in the form of a PPT. Uh, I thought it will be more efficient if we look at the entire code. So I'm going to try to do that right now. Machine learning. Uh, I'll be sharing all the resources that I'm using right now. So you can add in the chat box or in the uh, chat in the comments later on. OK, so I hope. All right, great. So we have the pre-processing step. So what is the code for the pre-processing step? What we're doing, we're importing libraries, we're importing NumPy, we're importing matplotlib, we're importing pandas. Then we are importing the data set, which is in this case, we're using user data.csv and then extracting the independent and dependent variable. Right now we know very clearly what independent and dependent variables are. Independent variable is the input, dependent variable is the output. So then we split the data set into training and test set like we've done for all the other um, machine learning models. We're using sklearn.model.sel underscore selection. From that, we're importing train test split, exactly like how we did for logistic regression, and we're doing this. We're splitting it. Then uh, we are importing something called standard scalar from sklearn.preprocessing. This is the preprocessing that is happening right now. So we are uh, transforming the x values that is the train value uh, the training data set and then the testing data set so if you see the data set this is what um, it is we have the user id user gender age estimated salary and the purchase so now we need to find a decision tree algorithm for the trainings for training the set so decision tree classifier for training the set from skl.tree, we import decision tree classifier. So this is something that needs to be imported from SQL tree library. Then classifier is equal to decision tree classifier. Criterion is equal to entropy and the random state is zero. So this is a criterion which is used to uh, measure the quality of the split, which is given by the, uh, by the entropy. So random state is zero for because we just want random states to be generated. We don't have any particular uh, state which we want to put over there for the model. Classifier dot fit x train comma y train. We're doing this for the both the uh, x the training and the testing algorithms, and this is what the output will be. Class weight is equal to none. Criterion entropy max depth none features. These are all uh, features which we can play around with once we are more familiar. So this is but this is what our output will be. And random state is equal to zero, splitter is equal to best, minimum samples split is equal to two, minimum sample leaf is equal to one. So what is this leaf split fraction, minimum weight fraction? Basically, we're trying to make a 
a decision tree. A decision tree is made in the terms of a flowchart, right? So we need to know how many leaves we discussed earlier. We have the decision nodes, then we have the leaf because each decision comes with two leaves. So all of that we are doing right here. We're trying to uh, make the most efficient decision tree that we can. Then we predict the test set result. Y underscore predict is equal to classifier dot predict of X test. Um, this is what our, we're predicting and this is our output. So if you, the below output image, we can see the real test. So this is the Y prediction and this is the testing. So prediction is the one that we were predicting and this test is the, it's comparing it with the actual values in real life. So test accuracy. So now that we've predicted it, we're going to test the accuracy, which is, which is what separates decision tree from the other uh, algorithms, basically the confusion matrix. So in the above output, we saw like there were some incorrect predictions. You can see over here, not everything is matching. This was our uh, prediction. This was our test. So you can see there are many differences. This here, one is matching here. One is matching here. One is matching, except for that. You can see the top three ones are not matching. So that means the accuracy is not there. So creating the confusion, that's why we are using the confusion matrix. So from SKL dot, uh, um, SK, SKL on dot uh, matrix, we import confusion matrix and CM is equal to confusion matrix by predict, comma, X predict. So confusion matrix is, so as you can see, uh, six plus three is equal to nine, which is the incorrect prediction. And 62 plus 29 is equal to 91, which is correct predictions. So I'll just scroll down a little bit, then you'll move on. Yeah. So we can say compared to other classification, decision tree classifier made a good prediction. That means because six uh, incorrect predictions and the correct predictions. So you can see how many incorrect predictions have taken place and how many correct predictions. We have only nine incorrect predictions, whereas we have 91 correct predictions. How do you know incorrect and correct? You can see over here, uh, this matrix zero and one add 62 and 29. That is, uh, that is the correct predictions. That is zero, the uh, zero, zero and one, one, whereas zero, one and one, zero are the incorrect predictions. So only nine incorrect predictions, whereas we have 91 correct predictions. What are we doing? We're extrapolating this data. Here we have only limited number of points. Here we are increasing the number of points when we're finding out. So that means the decision tree classifier has made a pretty good model for itself. It's a good prediction model. So now what we're doing, what we have to do, we have to visualize the result. Now we found out the accuracy, we found out the result. Now we're trying to visualize it. So matplotlib.colors import listed color map. So X set, Y set, X train, Y train, and uh, mesh grid we are using. All of these are what we all of these are like basically different functions which we are using to get the output. So as you can see, this is the output. We have estimated salary and age. So this is the different data points that we have. And uh, that is to get these data points, we're doing all of this. We have matplotlib.colors, we're importing listed color map. Uh, we have the X training, X train, Y train, that is a data set. Then we have a mesh grid. So to arrange the mesh grid, we have to set the values for start and stop and the step values. And for arranging it, we have X set min, uh, so we have again start, stop uh, and step for A range. Then we have contour, uh, then alpha and MTP dot X limit, Y limit, we're setting the maximum limits and in and enumerate and in, uh, in, um, in them dot unique y set then scattering then we finding for the title for labeling x y legend and show this does not include much logic you just have to memorize all of these different functions so that you can visualize you can look at this later also and um, you'll be able to make sense of it perfectly because it's just name of functions for plotting so here we see the decision tree algorithm and the estimated salary, the age. So because we have, um, so tree, what it's trying to do, it's trying to capture each data set. Uh, for, this is actually a very highly um, 
effective model i can say because it's unlike other models it's considering all possible cases that we can see that's why it's saying it's different from the rest of the classification model it has both vertical lines it has horizontal lines it splits the data set according to age and the salary and you can see it's very effectively splitting the data set so visualization is similar of the set result is similar to the training set except the training set so what were we doing here we were uh, we were using the training set that the set the data we used to train the model and now we'll have the actual mod, actual data that is the real time data that we have which will, it will predict so that's only the difference between test set and training set and we have the visualization here uh, so what is what is what can we understand using this so you see if the if the green dot is there in the green region it means that the prediction was correct if there is a green dot in a purple region that means the prediction was wrong if you can see there are certain green dots over here uh, uh, near the point 0 comma 0 that means these are the wrong predictions and you can see some purple dots are also there in the green region uh, so these are also wrong predictions so that is what ultimately we're trying to make sense of so this is the training set and this is the final test set if you can see that uh, in the test set we are finding lesser uh, finding lesser uh, discrepancies in the data that is the green uh, data points are mostly in the green region and the purple are mostly in the purple region that means our model is effective because using all that we have in training we consider a lot of unique cases also and edge cases so using that we have made our model so good that when we're putting the actual test set it's um, the output is better so this is um this is all about decision trees and i hope you understood even what the confusion matrix is the confusion matrix is was zero one uh, the number of so confusion matrix how we make uh, find out using the number of uh, let me go back to confusion matrix yeah, here the number of zero zero and uh, so number total number of correct predictions total number of incorrect predictions and that is what we'll use for judging our data set. So, and this is what a visualization is ultimately the result of our data set and our uh, entire decision tree classification algorithm. So I hope it's clear right now. So what were we trying to do from that time? We were trying to predict like salary based on your age. So that is what we were trying to do. So that is what you can see over here. X axis is age, Y axis is salary and as you get older your salary will get higher and it's that's what we're trying to do so i think now we are cleared using for uh, decision trees i'll move on to the next algorithm mm. okay so decision tree is done next we're moving on to knn algorithm so KNN algorithm is the K nearest neighbor algorithm. Okay, first, do you guys have any doubts at all uh, in the previous decision tree? You can go and uh, rewatch it later on itself, all the algorithms, if you want to clear a picture. But now, as of now, we can only look at the entire algorithm and the entire data set once. So, uh, I hope you understood the best given the time constraint. Okay, great. So decision tree, I think everyone understood. It's basically we have a decision node, we have the leaf nodes. We are using the prediction to find the number of the leaf nodes, number of decision nodes. Then finally, we have uh, we're plotting it and we're finding the confusion matrix to find the accuracy. And once, because once we're plotting it, we can understand how uh, how effective our uh, prediction was, how many wrong predictions we got, right predictions, and things. We can make a conclusion based on that. So yeah, now let's move on to KNN algorithm. So this algorithm is something that can be applied for both classification and regression problems and you know with the data science industry it's the most uh, widely used algorithm which you use to solve classification so it's a simple algorithm um, which has all 
test cases and classifies any new test cases by taking majority vote of k neighbors this is actually a very interesting algorithm if you look at the fundamental of it the case uh, so i hope this uh, these two graphs are visible to you there is there you can see a bunch of green dots which is the category a and then you can see a bunch of orange dots which is category b now what happens it's an algorithm in which uh, there's a majority vote of the k neighbors so these green dots and these uh, not dots i should not call it dots it's data points so these green and the orange points will be taking a vote and based on majority vote of its k neighbors uh, it this it's assigned to a class so because i think it got more votes in category a so it's moving to category a. it's been allotted category a so uh, so what exa how do we calculate which category it belongs to we use distance functions to perform the measurement so based the votes are taken based on basically a distance function so before knn it was no, it's a new class point and after knn it has been allotted to category a so what is the formula that we use so the formula, as I said, it was a distance related formula. So dH is equal to uh, summation i is equal to 1 to k and xi minus yi. So what is xi minus I, yi? It is the modulus of the distance between the points, right? So uh, and k is the number of neighbors. So it will suppose we put 5, it will look at only the 5 of the nearest points and find what is the uh, which class it is closer to overall so okay if x is equal to y then obviously d is equal to zero because the distance is zero it's coinciding and if x is not equal to y d is equal to one in case it's you know uh we have the values x and y values are in that manner so now we we'll look at the hands-on implementation mm. Okay, so we are first importing, uh, we're first import, it's, yeah, it's we're first importing matplotlib, sklearn, then pandas, uh, then we are printing the versions of the installed modules, it's not required, we're just testing if it's supported. Then using Jupyter Notebook, we are uh, importing all the functions that we need, all the libraries that we need, required modules for data visualization, then what we're doing, we're reading the data, we're reading the CSV file, which which contains the data set. Then what we're doing, we're counting the total output data from purchased column, that is data of purchased or value count. Then we're dividing the output class into uh, two sections, which is not purchased and purchased. And name is equal to the target balance. So target balance of purchased. So we're trying to find a balance between purchased and not purchased items in a, a commercial store. So the output will be, so figure is equal to go dot figure target class pi of dot i plot uh, figure. So what we're doing, we're printing the, we're plotting the output classes. So this is the uh, data that we are getting. We can see that it is not balanced. That is 180. Uh, people have not purchased the product, whereas 150 people have purchased it. That means, so KNN algorithm cannot be used because KNN algorithm fundamentally what it is, it's where a new data point comes and then we see what it's closest to. And based on that, we put it in a particular uh, class. But if the two classes have have very different have different number of data points then it's not even doesn't make sense so it needs to be balanced so being balanced is a prerequisite for using knn algorithm then only we can train our model using the data set so then we'll see the implementation again we're implementing so that was we checked this just so that we understand why we can't use it for um for unbalanced data sets so then we import the data set again. This is all we've already done. So what are we doing here? Importing data set. And then we are storing the input values in the X variable, output values in the Y variable. 
So we've imported the data set and then stored all the data input, except for the last uh, column to the x variable. The last column contains the output. So obviously we need the y variable. So SKL.model selection import train test split. We have already done this for all the models before, so we know exactly what this is. We are training into testing and training data. Then we are using standard scalar. We use this in decision tree as well. We are using it to uh, for scaling the training and the testing data. And now we are actually using the KN uh, algorithm. So from SKL on, uh, dot neighbors, we are importing K neighbors classifier. So classifier is equal to K neighbors classifier and neighbors is equal to three. Classifier dot fit, we're using the X train training values to uh, into the classifier and we're making the prediction. So we provide both input and output into the training model. After the training part, we provide the input of the testing data and stores the predicted output in the variable, obviously. So why what it's saying here is basically the output is stored in Yprint. And once we have predicted it, we have to check for accuracy. I hope you understood the prediction. This is the uh, the main essence of the KNN algorithm. So n neighbors is equal to three. It's taking the three closest neighbors and it's finding the different distances. Uh, and using the different distances, it's telling us uh, which set class it needs to be added to. Whatever it's closer to, it gets added to that class. Accuracy. From sklearn.metrics, we import accuracy score and we are printing this accuracy. We are passing the test uh, output and the prediction output and we'll see what exactly is our accuracy score. So this shows that the accuracy of our model is 80, 84%, which is good. Uh, so how do we change the accuracy? How do we make it more accurate? We have something called K values, which you already know. That is the number of points we are considering. So in, we have to select the correct K value so that we have a more accurate model. So instead of randomly choosing K values, we can use error curves to get the optimal K value. So what is an error curve? How do we plot it? So we use NumPy for this. Uh, we create sets for errors. So using KN, we do the KNN algorithm prediction over here and we store the errors. That is the differences between the um, our predicted algorithm and what our algorithm has predicted and what the actual output is. So we find all the errors and then we plot the errors, if you can see. Yeah. So over here for X coordinate, we have K value and Y coordinate, we have error. So we can see that when we have K is equal to four, uh, we find the least error. So because if you see the point uh, of X, uh, X, uh, the K value, uh, the that is the tra training and testing. We have to consider both to find what is the optimum K values uh, for it. So for testing and training, they both are this closest. That is the distance between the orange line and the blue orange curve and the blue curve is the least at X, K is equal to four. That means K is equal to four will give the optimum solution. Whereas if you see nearing one, you can see that the uh, the values of the test and train that is the orange curve and the y curve is maximum. So that means that is the least optimum solution. So k is equal to four is the most optimum solution we can find from the error graph. Then, then what do we do? Now that we understood what is the most optimum k value, we put that into our prediction model and we find the accuracy score. And you can see that the accuracy score has improved. It is now showing 85%. So this is, uh, how we do KNN algorithm? We use KNN algorithm for predictions. First, we we can uh, instead of blindly going and predicting it, we uh, have something called as uh, the error analysis and the error graph. So that using that, we find the optimum K solution, and fr from that, we put the K n neighbors is equal to the K, K value. Then it will look at the K uh, points around where the new point is, and will measure the distances. And whatever is closer, that is if the points in the average of the points uh, of A set is closer, that means it will get added to A. If the average of the distance between K and the, the new point and the points in B are is um, lesser, so then it will be added to B. So that is exactly what KNN algorithm is doing. Uh, I hope you understood. So for getting the most optimum, we need to plot the error graph. That is the only slightly different thing that we are doing over here. So I hope everyone is clear is everything good till now 
uh, any doubts, you have completed four major algorithms. So that is uh, very good considering the this is only usually what happens. People take one entire session for doing one algorithm, and we have completed four algorithms in that time, uh, and we still have more to do. So I think it's good. This I hope it's uh, your understanding. For your understanding, and this is the best that can happen. So any doubts? Uh, any algorithms? Linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree, KNN. Anything? Please put it in the chat box. Any doubts at all? Or do you want me to repeat anything? Or do you want to have, do you have any doubt in a particular con sub concept? Okay, no doubts then. Then we'll continue with the presentation. Now, we've looked at four different algorithms very much in detail because these four are uh, much, I think, more used frequently and um, more base, like more foundation, you know, they've, they have more uses rather than some of the algorithms. They are lesser used. So these are the most used and the most fundamental algorithms. So we covered them very much in detail. Now I just want to go through the rest of the algorithms. We have six more algorithms. I just want to uh, give a feel, like understand what the algorithm is and show the graph. And then we will, if we have time, we look at more algorithms in detail, or if you have any other uh, topic suggestion or something you want me to take or any doubts to solve, we'll go forward and do that. So the next algorithm we'll be looking at is SVM, that is Support Vector Machine Algorithm. So SVM algorithm is a method of classification algorithm in which you plot raw data as points in an n-dimensional space, uh, where n is the number of features you have. Features, we know what are features, input characteristics. The value of each feature is then tied to a particular coordinate, making it easy to classify the data. Lines called classifiers can be used to split the data and plot them on a graph. So you can see that the, uh, these two lines that you see, these dotted lines, and those are called like, and this straight line, we can call these lines as classifiers. And uh, n is the number of features, which is point, this is n dimensional space. So this is class one is the, you can see the blue color squares, that's class one. And the green circles are class two. So these are, both of them are called the support vectors and they are plotted in the n dimensional space. So support vector algorithm, that is the basic fun, like the, the concept of a support uh, vector algorithm. So the feature is tied to a particular coordinate. And because it's tied to a particular coordinate, it's easy to classify the data and split the data and plot it. So this is SVM algorithm. Uh, then we move on to native base algorithm. So a native base classifier assumes that the presence of a particular feature in a class is unrelated to the present of presence of any other feature. If you noticed uh, in KNN algorithm, the presence of a feature is related to the presence of the other feature because it's we're measuring the distance like the uh, difference of distance and then we're deciding which class it goes to so that is a complete opposite in the case of native base algorithm because the presence of a particular feature in a class is unrelated to the presence of any other feature so even if these features are related to each other a native base classifier would consider them all as different and independent when you're classifying the probability of an outcome so a native base a Bayesian model is easy to build because it's independent of any other feature and it's useful for massive data sets because we need some uh, model that is that uses a simple logic and it's easy to build when we are handling more data because we don't want an additional pressure of a complex algorithm. So it's simple and it outperforms even highly class sophisticated classification methods. So that is native base algorithm. Uh, what it does, the idea behind it. Then we have the k-means algorithm. So k-means is an unsupervised learning algorithm that involves clustering problems. Data sets are classified into a particular number of clusters. Let's call that number like k. And in such a way that all data points within a cluster are homogeneous and heterogeneous from the other data. So basically, 
uh, we can see before applying k-means clustering, we have all the data mixed together. And then we divide it into clusters. Each cluster will have similar kind of data points, which are data points. Each similar data points will um, like place together is called as a cluster. So each cluster is homogeneous and uh, they cannot be the same as the uh, data points in the other cluster. So this is what happens when we use k-means algorithm for uh, classifying it. And next we move, we have, yeah, k-means, how, do, how does the cluster uh, form? So k-means algorithms, it pricks k number of points, which we call as centroids from each cluster. And each data point forms a cluster with the closest centroids, which is k clusters. So it creates a new centroid based on the existing cluster members, which these new centroids, the closest distance for each data point is determined. So what happens? So here, if you see, it would have picked one data point, one data point for the red, one particular data point, which it calls centroid, one data point for uh, the yellow points and one for the blue. So once these three, um, three centroids are fixed, the closest to the centroid will get added to the cluster. So now what will happen? The cluster will have two points. So these two points, the, we'll find the centroid of these two points. And whatever is closest to the centroid of these two points, it will also get added. Then we find the centroid of the three points. And then whatever is closest will get added. This way, what happens? The entire data is divided into k number of uh, clusters. So with these new clusters, the closest distance for each data point is determined. And this process is repeated until the centroids do not change. So when the centroid does not change, it means that finally all the similar homogeneous data points have come together. And there are no more data points which need to be added to that particular color cluster. So once that has happened, that means the classification is complete. So then next we have something, a random forest algorithm, a collection, a collective of decision trees. So random forest, I think that kind of, uh, encapsulates the essence of this algorithm. It has different decision trees and the trees together make a forest. In the same sense, we have different decision trees which together make the random forest. So to classify a new object based on its attributes, each tree is classified and the tree, um, we, something, we call something as, we call this as voting this entire process. So for each class, a vote will be casted and the forest chooses the classification having the most number of votes. We saw how we can uh, implement different decision tree models by changing the value input, uh, the, changing the point that we use for finding the, uh, determining the tree, that is the number of nodes and then how it goes in the path that is chosen of the decision tree. So you can see in decision tree, it goes to the rightmost nodes and in decision tree two, it goes to the rightmost node, and then it goes to one left node. And in the decision and in, in the tree last one, the third end decision tree, it goes zigzag. So each of them, uh, the same input will be given to each of them. And then what we'll get, this is class A, this is class B, class C. We'll find what has the most uh, accuracy or what has the most relevance. And based on that, we will find the we'll form the final class. Whichever classification, whether it's class A, class B, class C, uh, whichever one has the most number of votes that is uh, most efficient, then that will be the final class that is selected. This is what we call a random forest algorithm. So each tree is planted. We call this as planting of trees and growth of trees because we're uh, revolving around the concept of forest. So if the number of cases in the training set is n, then the sample of n cases is taken at random. If the sample will be training the set to, uh, the sample will be this training set for the growing, for growing the tree. That is the, the increasing the number of nodes and uh, that's what we call growing the tree. So if the number of cases in the training set is n, yeah, sample of n cases is taken. So if there are m input variables, a number m, which is less than, much lesser than m, is specified such that each node m variables are selected at random out of the m. And the best split on this m is used to split their node. The value of m is held constant during the process. I think uh, we saw how exactly a decision tree works, right? So there are m input variables. And then out of that, we take a number, which is much smaller than m, and we'll be using that for uh, splitting. 
So we'll select those variables at random from M and then we'll, uh, we'll split in these variables. So this is selected completely at random and we check it's held constant during the entire process. So each tree is grown to the most substantial extent possible and there is no pruning. That is, you know what we did uh, previously, once the decision tree model, we're trying to find the most effective uh, value so that uh, splitting, how the splitting needs to take place, that the accuracy is high. We don't do anything that is called pruning. We don't do that over here. It's allowed to grow. We keep M constant during the entire process. We're allowed to grow given that random value. And then we select the best, uh, the tree with the best outcome. So that is what we used for random uh, forest algorithm for. Then we have something called as dimensionality reduction algorithms. So in so what happens? It, there are a lot of data which is being stored and analyzed by the corporates, the government, research uh, companies for medical purposes. So what data scientists do they take the raw data and have which has a lot of information and for any for them to make any sense of this data it needs to be put in a more simpler form right so the we have to find identify patterns in the data to understand the trends in the market and things so uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm is something that will help you find the relevant details and uh, take out the relevant information from the unrelevant ones so that we can understand what's going on so if you see over here, the rightmost image, it shows that the entire, it contains two dimensions and it's very confusing what is happening over here. So no, if uh, so, we're dividing it into two different dimensions, which is two separate graphs so that we, uh, we can make sense of the data. Because if data is mixed, one of the, so in data science, what they do is first step is they clean the data. They take, get the correct data set and then they clean the data so that they can make, otherwise there's no use of the data. Even if you have a lot of data and you're trying to make predictions, nothing will make sense unless the data is sorted and it's relevant to what is being going to be done. So that's what we're doing over here. Dimensionality reduction, it's reducing from two dimensions to one dimension with two graphs of one dimension so that we can use the data and have some, uh, to have some fruitful purpose so decision trees dimensionality these are the different uh, uh dimensionality reduction algorithms. Like we have decision tree factor analysis missing value ratio random forest so once we reduce the uh, dimensions we can use these algorithms and find whatever prediction that we want so the last algorithm is the gradient boosting algorithm and the ARA boosting algorithm so these are boosting algorithms which you used when massive when we have huge sets of data then uh and so when we have um, a lot of data the thing is accuracy try, tends to go low because of the computation power that is required so boosting is something that we use to uh, it's a learning algorithm that combines the predictive power of several base estimators and then it increases the speed so that it has accuracy speed when making predictions and it can also handle large data so it in short it combines multiple weak or average predictions to build a strong predictor these boosting algorithms always work well in data science competitions like Kaggle, av hackathon and things so these are the most preferred machine learning algorithms um use we use them with both python and r codes to achieve accurate outcomes that is we use different models so we've learned a lot of different models. We've learned decision tree, KNN, linear regression, holistic regression. So we make the same prediction using different models, which are all average, which we call average predictors. And using all those predictions, we make a bigger final prediction, which is the strong predictor. So that is what we call as gradient boosting or ADA boosting. So uh, we are fine using different algorithms. You get smaller predictions and you, finally we make a proper uh, accurate, highly accurate prediction. So with this, uh, we are covering all the algorithms that we have for today. So I'll go back to the overview slide. Yeah, so we covered linear regression, logistic regression, decision tree and KNN in detail with a use case. And the rest of the algorithms, I've just given a basic brief with a graph uh, or a diagram.
So some of these algorithms, like random forest algorithm, we don't need to discuss because it's basically decision tree, multiple decision trees. Gradient boosting algorithm also uses average algorithms, and then it finally makes a prediction. So we don't, we don't, uh, we can't discuss that. There's no use of discussing that too much in detail. Even dimensionality reduction works in somewhat the same way. It reduces the data to proper singular dimensions from which we can find the predict we can predict it using other algorithms like decision tree or KNN. Uh, so random forest. So the other algorithms which so these three will it's no use discussing them too much in detail as well. So the other four algorithms, SVM algorithm, native base algorithm, K means uh if okay, uh, if you have if anyone wants me to discuss these in detail, you can tell me which algorithm you want to discuss more in detail then we can uh, go for that algorithm. Because we have finished uh, what we were intending to cover. Um, so if anyone has doubts, we can, I'll first take the doubts. And if you want to learn any of these algorithms in depth, we can, you can tell me, I'll share the required material and we can do it. So firstly, does anyone have any doubts, any algorithm? Because uh, the last six algorithms we just covered uh, quickly in a brief manner. So if anyone has doubts, you can ask. Any doubts or is everyone clear with what's going on? Mm, I do not see any doubts. Then can you guys tell me which algorithm would you like to use? We'll learn more about. Anything at all? You can put in the comment section anything you want me to do. All clear. OK, that's great. I'm so glad you guys were able to understand. So let me know now which what do you want to do? Do you want to do SVM, native base, k-means? Um, OK, then. Then what I'll do is I'll take one more algorithm, because uh, I think we have some time. and. Uh, SVM is quite different when compared to the other two. So I will share the required material for STM and I'll just cover that up. Because I think that is slightly interesting, a bit different, you know. Uh, share the screen. Okay, so, okay, as we know already, SVM, the main objective is to draw a line between the two classes of data points. So SVM generates a line that cleanly separates the two classes, how you clean, uh, there are many possibilities how we clean and we have a line which separates the two classes. So how it's determined, we have margins and we have support vectors, so which we use to divide the two data sets. So let's see how we implement it. So first, we import the data set. We import pandas from uh, SPD. Then we import, we read the data in the form of a CSV file. Here we have weight, size, and we have the class that is orange or apple. So we have to divide all the oranges on one side of the line and apples on the other side of the line. So splitting the data set into training and test samples from SKL.model selection import train test split, training set, test set. So we have seen this multiple times now. I'm sure everyone knows what train test split um, does. Then we have predictors and target. So X train is the training values of X. Uh, then X train, Y train. These are the testing values, X test, Y test. Then we initialize the support vector machine and fitting the training data. That is from SVM. we import SVC, which is the support vector machine. So classifier is equal to SVC, kernel is equal to RBF, and random state is equal to 1. So classifier.fit, x train, and y train. 
so we have to now predict the classes for the next so what happens we have a set of classes in the training data which is used to train like once so that it understands when a new uh, point comes we it understands which class to put it in so that's what the training data does so now we have to test it the, we have to predict it there will be now testing data will go and it has to predict which class it belongs to so classify dot predict x test test uh, underscore set predictions is equal to y underscore pred so now we compare the actual classes and the predictions let's see so the predictions are quite accurate you can see orange orange apple here it has made a wrong prediction it's they thought an apple orange is an apple then orange orange apple apple orange orange apple apple so we can see only one mistake has been made so uh, so only one out of the eight predictions has gone wrong that's pretty good so if we increase the data set uh, data set we'll get more accuracy so skl learn dot metrics import confusion matrix so i we've done confusion matrix before as well and we're using it over here again uh, to find the accuracy y test uh, y prediction accuracy is equal to float diagonal dot sum by this is basically the mathematical function which we use to find the accuracy so we find the diagonal values we find all the sum of the diagonal values and you divide it by the length then it shows us the accuracy so uh so accuracy over here is 87.5 percent or 0 0.857 then we visualize the classifier now that we found the accuracy we need to visualize it so we import label encoder and uh, we put the training values inside and classify dot fit extreme then we have the entire visualization code uh which we already did in detail this has all the labels and uh, we have the mesh grid and a range set and this is what happens so it has shown the different apples and orange so this is the plotting of the training set after fitting the training set to the classifier the border that separates them is uh, the maximum margin have a plane or the line basically the line that separates the clean line that separates the, the two different classes so so anything what happens any new data point which falls in the white region will be considered an orange and anything that falls in the uh, black region will be considered an apple visualization so that was using the training data and this is the testing data so testing data we can see that one prediction has gone wrong one point that has fallen fallen on the border line uh, is actually an orange but it is considered an apple so all these predictions are based on the weight and the size, right? So because apples tend to be more uh, in the range of 72 grams and 5.5 centimeters, uh, anything, any fruit that falls in that range, it's considering an apple. But these borderline cases, which are closer to the line, it will get a little bit confused. The model will get confused because there are oranges which weigh more and are bigger in size. And whereas there might be apples which are slightly lighter also. So that that's the uh, scope of error that we have in this algorithm but except for that it's a very simple algorithm which we can use for different purposes so yeah so this is how we do we use svm algorithm for uh, understanding the different uh, understanding data so when we get a new data point it will see which part of the graph it, it falls in and depending on that it will decide whether it's an apple or an orange so this is what svm algorithm was all about uh is any okay so i think now we've covered svm also and we've covered almost everything in detail so i'll share the me the presentation once again so we'll see mm -hmm. so okay so now we've covered five algorithms in detail uh native base algorithm is left k means is also there but k means is actually quite similar now because we've done knn you'll find k means very easy and native base is also uh, pretty simple so i don't think too much explanation is required for that per se uh if any of you have any doubts i keep asking but if any any doubts at all please let me know now i will take it up because throughout the session we haven't had any doubts so i just like to know any any confusion any point where you want me to explain more in detail or any code you want me to go over once again we'll do that right now
okay it doesn't look like anyone has uh, doubts guys feel free to put in any questions that you have uh we'll answer i'll try my best to answer now if not we'll even come back to you later so even at any point you have any doubts please put it in the chat box okay then so all right no doubts then i will just uh conclude and we will see what exactly we have learned throughout the session we'll just have a small summary and we can end the session so we learned about linear regression uh, just one slide for we'll just understand so linear regression we have input characteristics over here we learned about engine size and for a given uh, engine size we multiply it by one factor we multiply it by a factor and we get the emission so linear relation that we have and the formula that we use y is equal to b naught plus b1 into x1 b naught is the intercept y intercept b1 is coefficient of input feature and x1 is input feature whereas y is the output so this was linear regression and we used the this data set of engines to find the co2 carbon emissions so and we found we trained the model we uh, checked for accuracy we split it into training and testing we tested it and so we did everything that we had to so for linear regression finally we implemented it found the most accurate r to score and then we put the r to score back and we found the correct prediction so that was linear regression um yeah predicting co2 emissions when we have engine size next we move on to logistic regression logistic regression is a classification algorithm which we use whereas we we get the we put the values into linear regression we get the output from the linear regression we put it through sigmoid function and we get a final output this final output is what our, uh, is the output of our logistic regression and it's uh, expressed in terms of probability because it is between 0 to 1 right so logistic regression is used in predictions forecasting uh logistic this yeah sigmoid function we looked at one by one plus e to the power minus t and t is the output of the linear regression which is b naught plus b1 into x and same imported library split into training testing setting everything to zero putting it through uh, defining sigmoid function uh, updating the loops uh weights and bias yeah we're putting the weights and bias which earlier we had set it as zero now we're updating the correct values then we're finding the predictor we're predicting it and we're using the predict function we're checking the accuracy we're finding the number of iterations which gives us the most accuracy then we go back and put it in the predict function and find the correct values that was logistic regression then decision tree we have different leaf nodes and the decision nodes how we find the number of leaf nodes and decision nodes we that is the basically what the decision tree algorithm is we have pre-processing we have to find a fitting decision tree algorithm and then train the set and then we have to using the training set we have to put uh, visualize it then we have to predict the uh, put the actual test set and visualize it again and then we check the result uh, by creating a confusion matrix and then we visualize the final result and we see how effective our model is so then we have that is what that was decision tree finding the number of modes and you know understanding how exactly a effective decision tree is uh, constructed then we had a knn algorithm which is the nearest neighbor algorithm this algorithm can be used we saw for both classification and regression very popular algorithm a new data, data point is introduced whichever category it is class it is closer to whose points it is closer to it gets added so for that we have k that k is the number of points it will consider for finding uh, k is the number of nearby points and then depending on distance it gets added to whichever class it's closer to. now svm uh, algorithm we saw how it divides it into two sections uh, using a line this line is a uh, called classifiers are used to split the data and plot them on the graph and any new point which falls on that side of the line will be considered as class one and this side is class two and then native base we found that uh it does not use any it does not have any 
uh, bias beforehand. It's not none of the points are related to each other. So it just keeps um, features even if they're related, the way classifier will consider them as not related, and then it will calculate the probability of it following on this side and uh, the other side. So it's a highly sophisticated class. Uh, you know, it's a it's not highly sophisticated. Um, that is what makes it more efficient because even sophisticated will have problems for larger data sets or because more computation uh, computations are there. But because it's a simple algorithm, it just uses basic probability to decide which side of the uh, line it should be in. So that's why native base algorithm is effective. Then we have k-means in which we find a centroid and we keep adding points and finding new centroids until all the points of a cluster are homogeneous and now none of the points are left behind. So yeah, k number of points for centroids. Each centroid finds the close each point finds the closest centroid and keeps adding. So this is k-means algorithm, and the random forest algorithm uses many sub trees, decision trees, and whichever decision tree gives us the best uh, output, that is the best number, the votes, has the most votes, it becomes the final class. So planting and growing the tree is there and we don't do any pruning, that is we don't do any optimization in between when the, when the tree is growing. So then we have the dimensionality reduction algorithm where we are just simply uh, separating the data into smaller, into the different dimensions so that we can uh, analyze it. So it uses decision tree, random forest to actually analyze the data, but this algorithm just basically separates it. Then we have gradient boosting algorithm finally, which we uh, uses multiple average predictors and finally makes a major prediction, which is which is the most uh, accurate. So this is very useful in terms when we have high large number of data, massive data sets. This is this algorithm is efficient because it has multiple, it's dividing it into smaller parts, right? Multiple algorithms are there. Multiple predictors are used. And finally, we get a very strong prediction. So that was gradient boosting algorithm. I hope everything is clear. We have looked at all of the different algorithms right now. And uh, that's all we had planned for today. This is actually quite a lot. I hope you guys understood because we did a lot today. We did we looked at 10 different machine learning algorithms. Now, if you want to go in and start working on projects or uh, smaller projects or you want to take on bigger algorithms, I think you can um, do it because you understood all the basics. We covered all of that and it's quite impressive. It's only been one hour, 45 minutes, and we have covered 10 algorithms and five of them in detail using an example. So thank you guys, whoever is still in the live and whoever's made it all the way to the end of the video. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for having the patience. I hope it has benefited you guys. Uh, we, with that, we come to the end of the session. And I hope it has been useful. <laughs> That, and it's been a long session, but it was very, very uh, effective, hopefully, because we we covered quite a bit today. And hopefully using this information, you can you find this uh, in you find the all these algorithms interesting, how different predictions are made. And hopefully I hope you feel interested in the field of machine learning and you want to discover it further. So we will be having a follow up session for that. So do attend it on 15th uh five o'clock so do attend that session but as of now today what well, this is all we have for you today hope you enjoyed the session Thank you for attending our live today. We hope you gain new knowledge and interest from this small glimpse we showed you into the world of machine learning.